What we're going to do here then is go through this problem as quick as we can, solving it with the method of undetermined coefficients, then integrating factors. Then we'll also solve it with Laplace transforms. And we'll see that the Laplace transform approach is definitely harder for this example. But as I mentioned last time, there are other examples where you really can't do it any other way. Pretty much the Laplace transform is the way to go with some other examples. So let's go ahead and quickly do the method of undetermined coefficients first. That's where you first want to think about the corresponding homogeneous equation, which means, well, if you're writing the differential equation in what's called, again, linear operator form like this, where the derivative and the y term on the left side and the forcing function, so to speak, is on the right, that's where you get rid of the t. You make it a zero, you make it unforced. That would be the corresponding homogeneous equation. And if you subtract the three y back from both sides, you get this. And we've dealt with equations like this so much, you don't have to bother separating variables. You can just see that the answer has got to be C e to the negative 3t as a general solution. Then you want to find a particular solution of the non-homogeneous force equation. And the way you do it is you think about the form of the right-hand side forcing function. It seems to be easier when you have it in linear operator form to think about that. You're after a function whose derivative plus three times the function always equals t, no matter what t is. So you don't want to choose trig functions. You don't want to choose exponential functions. If this were a trig or exponential function, then you would want to choose those things. But it's a linear function of t. It turns out to be good enough to pick a linear function of t here as well. And that would apply, by the way, if this were more complicated, if it was like 5t plus 7, you would still guess a linear function of t here. We need to plug this into the differential equation and solve for a and b. yp prime plus 3yp. Try to do that in my head here. The t term is only going to come from 3 times yp, so that'll be 3at. And the constant term is going to come from both the derivative and 3 times yp. The derivative is a. 3 times yp is going to give you plus 3b. You want this to equal the right-hand side. Set this equal to t no matter what t is. The only way that's going to happen is if 3a is 1 and a plus 3b is 0. So you get a system of linear equations in a and b. All right, the only way these two functions of t can be equal for all t is if that constant term goes away, if it's zero, and the coefficients of t match, the coefficient of t there is one, so 3a must equal one. System of linear equations that you can solve pretty quickly by inspection, a is one third, and then let's see, b is gonna be negative one third a, solving that equation for b, and plug in A equals one third, you get negative one ninth. Okay, so if you did that, congratulate yourself. You got the right A and B. Hopefully everybody did that. What have we done so far? We found a general solution to the corresponding homogeneous equation and a particular solution, one solution of the original non-homogeneous equation. Um, so now we need to add them to find a general solution of the original non-homogeneous equation. That can be justified by linear operator properties back in chapter one, that you can do that. So you get C e to the negative three T, A is one third, so I get plus one third T and B is negative one ninth, so I get minus one ninth. Solve an initial value problem, Y of zero equals four, plug in T equals zero, E to the zero is one, so C is four plus one ninth, getting a common denominator of nine, gives you 37 ninths in the end. And so finally, your unique solution of the IVP is Y equals 37 ninths E to the negative three T plus one third T minus one ninth. Let's also solve it by integrating factors. For short, I'll write y prime. 
There's again my differential equation. Traditional to call the integrating factor mu, but it's not a parameter, it's a function. E to the integral of whatever's in front of the T, of the Y, excuse me, on the left-hand side, just the constant function three. It's not always a constant function. There are some integrating factor problems where the coefficient of Y depends on T. It could be a T or a T squared, or maybe even one over T plus two or something like that. You still do E to the integral of that thing. You are just after one antiderivative there, so you can take the C to be zero. Our integrating factor is E to the three T. It's a factor because we multiply the differential equation on both sides of it. So it becomes a factor of both sides. Don't forget to do it on the right. That's a common mistake is to forget to do it on the right. The great the thing about integrating factors and why they're called integrating factors is because it's almost as if by magic, it makes the left-hand side easy to integrate because it's the derivative by the product rule of e to the three t times y. Keeping in mind in your head, y is a function of t. Though I'm not explicitly writing that here. If you differentiate this, the, the derivative of the, uh, the first function is e to the three t times the derivative of the second function, y prime, plus the derivative of the first function, three e to the three t times the second function. That's the product rule that verifies that. And if you do it right with integrating factors, that'll always happen. So this is easy to integrate. You just get e to the three t times y when you integrate. But the left-hand side is trickier to integrate. So we're integrating now. e to the 3t times y equals the integral of t e to the 3t. When you do the integral on the right, you do want to get the constant of integration in there because that's going to be your arbitrary constant for your solution. If you have to do this by hand, well, I mean, maybe if you're really good at it, you can guess the answer. But most of us mortals need to use integration by parts to help us do this. You typically want u to be something that becomes simpler when you differentiate it. t will become simpler when you differentiate it. d will be dt. In other words, u prime will equal 1. But more importantly, you want dv or v prime to be something easy to integrate. Well, it's the other factor. It's got to be the e to the 3t. Is that easy to integrate? Yeah. One third e to the 3t. That's more important that you can actually find V. Maybe you're not used to the DV notation there. Maybe you're used to just writing V prime as E to the three T. That's fine. Either way you do it. Use the integration by parts formula, UV minus the integral of V DU or U prime if you prefer. U times V, multiply these functions there to get one third T E to the three T minus the integral of v du is the product of these two things. Integral of one third e to the three t dt. I like that I'm seeing one thirds in there and I like that when I integrate that, I'm gonna get a one ninth. It's starting to make me feel like we are on the right track, right? Because we saw a one third and a one ninth in the final answer. Don't forget your constant of integration here because that's gonna become the arbitrary constant for the solution. So we've got e to the three times the solution equals that. I want the solution, so I need to divide both sides by e to the three t now, so that I've got y isolated. That's the same as multiplying both sides by e to the negative three t. Get cancellation there, leaving with one third t. Cancellation there, leaving you with minus one ninth, plus c e to the negative three t. And it's the same and it's the same general solution. <clears throat> so the same initial value problem is going to give you the same unique solution. I won't show the details again, but if you write it in this form, the C ends up again being 37 ninths. Same answer as before, just written in a different order. Okay, once again, Y of zero is four. All right, now let's do Laplace transform method. Let's write the differential equation in the linear operator form. So I typically like to do it. It's not that you have to do it that way, but I like, like to do it that way. 
what we're going to do is we're going to take the Laplace transform of both sides of this equation. Cursive L of, I'll write Y prime for short, Y prime plus three Y equals cursive L of T. Well, what in the world is that? I guess we better figure out at least to start with, what's the Laplace transform of T? And I guess that's gonna require going back to the definition of the Laplace transform as the improper integral from zero to infinity but whatever this function is, it's t times e to the negative st dt, right? That was the definition that we saw last time. It's an improper integral of whatever function's in there times e to the negative st dt, assuming the improper integral converges at least. And at least if s is positive, it will converge because you'll have an exponential decay there times a function that is growing, but not as fast as the exponential decay is decaying. This improper integral will converge and I will go ahead and be sloppy and not bother writing limit signs. We need to use integration by parts here as well, right? We're integrating with respect to T. So when we do the integral, we're treating the T as the variable and the S as a constant. Uh, but in the end, you integrate the t out, you get something that still depends on s. And so in the end, you think of it as a function of s. Why s? It's just traditional. It doesn't really have any meaning. U is t, u prime is one, or du, I guess I did that the opposite way here, is dt. V is gonna be the integral of e to the negative st negative one over s e to the negative st. Remember, t is the variable for the integral here. So s is a constant, I get a negative one over s in front. You can check that by differentiation. Use the integration by parts formula again. u times v is gonna be negative one over s t e to the negative st. It's gonna be evaluated from zero to infinity minus the integral of the product of these two things. See a minus sign there, so that's gonna cancel, giving a plus sign. 1 over s is a constant that can be factored out of the integral. This is going to be the integral to do. You might hope, cross your fingers, is that 0? Yes, it is. When you plug in 0 for sure, in place of t, you get 0. When you quote unquote plug in infinity, do you get 0? Yes, the limit as t goes to infinity of this thing is 0 when s is positive. <laughs> If you had to verify that or prove that, you'd want to use L'Hopital's rule from Calc. We don't want to take the time to use L'Hopital's rule. Uh, okay, that's zero. Careful, make sure it really is zero though, okay? Because this one's not going to be zero when I do this one. Yes, when you plug in t equals zero, for sure you get zero. When you plug in t equals infinity, pretending you can plug in infinity, really it's a limit. You get zero when S is positive. S must be positive for this to work. This integral gives you negative one over S squared e to the negative ST from zero to infinity. When you quote unquote plug in infinity, that gives you zero, but when you plug in zero, you do not get zero. Right, there's no T in front of there. Plug in t equals zero, you get e to the zero is one, but it's being subtracted because it's in the bottom. You're really getting zero minus this thing. The two minus signs cancel. In the end, you get one over s squared. That's the Laplace transform of t. This function of t is getting transformed to a new function of s. With derivatives, it's analogous to a derivative operator. Like the derivative of t is of the function one. The derivative of t squared is the function two t. The Laplace transform of t, well, you don't say it's a function of t, you say it's a function of s. I mean, could we say it's a function of t? Could we, could we make this a function of t if we, if we wanted to? It's just less, it's better to use a different letter. So I guess that's what this thing becomes over here is a one over s squared. How is this is helpful is mysterious, okay? We're working at it. 
What about this side? How can I figure out what that is if I don't know what Y is? I'm trying to find Y, right? I'm trying to solve the differential equation. Well, one thing you can do is L is a linear transformation of function spaces. I can write L of this linear combination, since linear transformations are operation preserving, is L of Y prime plus three times L of Y. Y prime plus three Y is a linear combination of two functions, Y prime and Y. Coefficients, weights are one and three. L being a linear transformation, which you're just trusting me on, means that I get the corresponding linear combination of the individual functions. Same coefficients or weights, one and three. Is that hard to prove that L is a linear transformation? No, it's actually not too hard to prove. Effectively, you have to you know, replace the, in the abstract, the T here with some linear combination of a couple functions and use linearity properties of integrals to prove it. So it's not too hard to prove, assuming all these improper integrals converge, which were, is always an implicit assumption here. That's got to equal one over S squared. Okay, L of Y prime plus three L of Y equals one over S squared, who cares? Maybe, maybe, maybe if I knew what L of Y was, maybe I could figure out why. That's the big idea. If you knew what L of Y was, maybe you could figure out why. But that L of Y prime is kind of messing things up. We need another property of Laplace transforms. What's L of Y prime in general? Let's just get rid of the reds. L of Y prime in general should be this integral. Oh, there's a reason I was using integration by parts all the time today. I should use integration by parts here maybe, except the role of the U and the DV are gonna be a little different. For sure I want, well, I don't want to pick U to be Y prime because then U prime U, or DU would be Y double prime. That sounds worse. So I better let the U be E to the negative ST and the DV be Y prime of T dt. Oh yeah, when I figure out V, that's just going to be a Y. That, that sounds good. And du is going to be negative s e to the negative s t dt u times v be the product of these two things will be y of t e to the negative s t be evaluated from zero to infinity minus the integral of v du. I can factor out the negative s to give me a plus s outside. And I guess I get y of t times e to the negative st. You might hope this is zero. Wait a minute, is it zero? Not necessarily. This is not zero, but it does simplify to y of zero. Why? At least when s is positive, What's the limit of this as t goes to infinity? Is it really, is that limit really zero? Does the exponential decay beat out the y of t? Actually, not necessarily. But assume it does. Is that okay? Well, it's okay if you assume it. So for classes of functions y of t, where this product goes to zero as t goes to infinity, which means y can't grow faster than exponential growth, then this will go to zero as t goes to infinity. But when you plug in zero, you get y of zero times e to the zero, you get y of zero. And in fact, I've made a mistake there. It's a negative y of zero. Because you're subtracting it. And what about this part? That's plus s times, well, this is, hey, look at that. That's Laplace transform of y. 
So what we're concluding here is L of Y prime under certain conditions on Y is S times L of Y minus Y of zero. Yes, you gotta have certain conditions on Y. Y cannot grow faster than exponential growth for any value of S. Why can't grow too fast? Most functions we deal with here don't grow too fast, so we don't have to worry about it. That'll go zero as t goes to infinity. When you plug in t equals zero, you'll be subtracting y of zero. This is plus s times l of y. So we have, we are now able to rewrite the differential equation, uh, the Laplace transform of the differential equation in a form that does not involve l of y prime. And look, there's the initial condition. Y of zero, that's a minus four. That was our initial condition. Um, what, have, what's, what have we done here? We've converted a differential equation in Y and Y prime to an algebra equation in L of Y. Algebraically solve for L of Y. And once we've got L of Y, maybe we can figure out Y. Maybe. Do uh, a bit of algebra. To write this, divide both sides by s plus three to get this. Huh. So that's the Laplace transform of the answer. So obviously the answer is that. Obviously, right? No, it's still not so obvious, is it? What do we need to do here? Somebody asked this about integrals. Now we've got to use partial fractions. With this one here, we need to write this as a sum of simpler fractions. A little bit strange here, a little bit harder example of partial fractions because we have an S squared there. You actually don't write it as something over S squared plus something over S plus three. You also need a term something over S when you've got a factor squared. I'll write it as A over S plus B over S squared plus C over S plus three. Why is this a good idea? Because finding the inverse Laplace transform, undoing the Laplace transform to, for terms like this is gonna be a lot easier than for something like that. That's why. Oh, do we really have to do this? Yeah, I think we need to. I want these to be equal no matter what S is. It's simpler if you get rid of the fractions. So multiply both sides of the equality of these two things by the common denominator there, S squared times S plus three. You'll get a one on the left side because the S squared and S plus three will cancel. On the right, you'll get partial cancellation. One S will cancel there, leaving another S and an S plus three. Two S's, an S squared, in other words, is what I meant to say. We'll cancel there, but not the S plus three. And the S plus three will cancel there, leaving an S squared. Now you can multiply all this stuff out and equate like terms to give a system of three linear equations in the three unknowns, A, B, and C. And you could use matrix methods to solve such a system, but it's a lot quicker to do a little trick here. Plug in some special values of S to make it easier to solve for A, B, and C. Like plugging in zero is a good idea because you get a bunch of cancellation. Now you might wonder, does this really work? Because after all, this thing's undefined when S is zero. It turns out magically to still work. You plug in S equals zero on the right, that's zero, that's zero, you just get three B. So B is easy to solve for, B is one third. Oh, one third, I'm happy. Uh, how about S e plugging in S equals negative three sounds like a good idea, because these two things will go away. I'll get one equals C times negative three squared is nine C, oh, one ninth. C is one ninth. 
Is the 37.9 going to pop out? Uh, not immediately, but it will when we combine it with this four. What other value should of S should I pick? Well, there's no obvious thing that's going to make anything else zero here. Uh, just pick something relatively simple like one. If S is one, then I get uh, one times four is four A. Four B becomes four thirds. And then one squared times C becomes one ninth. Four thirds plus one ninth. Four thirds is 12 ninths. Plus one ninth is 13 ninths. So it looks like 4a is 1 minus 13 ninths is negative 4 ninths. And so a is negative 1 ninth. So going back up here, what we've just found is that this function is negative one ninth over S uh, B is one third plus one third over S squared plus what's C? C is one ninth, one ninth over S plus three plus, don't forget the four over S plus three. And these two can combine into Guess what? 37 ninths over S plus three. We're almost there. That's the Laplace transform of our solution. Now I've got to figure out the solution. I've got to take the inverse Laplace transform of both sides. But wait a minute. What's the formula for the inverse Laplace transform? Have I written it down anywhere? No, I have not. And in fact, there's no formula for it. It's like anti-differentiation. When you start learning anti-differentiation, you got to do it by guessing. How do you guess? Well, let's look at this one first. Maybe that might be the good one to start with. One third over S squared. What's the inverse Laplace transform of that? Guess what? This work I did up here to see that the Laplace transform of T is going to be helpful. The Laplace transform of T is one over S squared. Therefore, the inverse Laplace transform of one over S squared is T. Therefore, the inverse Laplace transform of one third over S squared is one third T. That was part of the answer, one third T. What about the inverse Laplace transform of negative one ninth over S. It is the constant function negative one ninth. Why? Last time we saw that the Laplace transform of E to the AT was one over S minus A. And when A is zero, E to the AT is one, the constant function one. So the Laplace transform of one is one over S. So the inverse Laplace transform of one over S is one, and therefore the inverse Laplace transform of negative one ninth over S is negative one ninth. Negative one ninth. And that the inverse Laplace transform of this thing, 37 ninths over S plus three has got to be 37 ninths times e to the negative three T because of that. A is negative three. Hey, look at that, compare it with that. A is negative three. S plus three is S minus negative three. Inverse Laplace transform of one over S plus three has got to be e to the negative three T. The 37 ninths just get carried along for the ride. But Laplace transforms a linear transformation. The inverse Laplace transform is also a linear transformation. Inverse Laplace transform of a linear combination is the corresponding linear combination of the inverse Laplace transforms. Yes, we do get this, the correct final answer. A lot more work. Why in the world would we ever do it this way unless we just enjoy doing crazy stuff like this? Uh, Cause again, we'll see on Friday, we'll do look at an example. 
There are some examples where you can't do it any other way.